and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, I slow down my Spectrum. I play some games. I chat to Jeff. And end with some serious software. But first, let's get playing. really bad at games, or were not old enough to grasp the fast-moving graphics and game mechanics, or you just wanted to practice those really difficult levels, you had a few weapons at your disposal. First, you could scour the magazines in the hope you could find an infinite lives poke or some other cheat. You could hope someone had produced a map or hints for the game. Or you could use one of the many multi-face type devices to save out different stages of the games or poke more lives. All of these options had one major flaw though, the game would still run at the same speed. To the rescue came a few companies with the same idea. First on the scene was Cambridge Computing, who introduced their slow-mo device around September 1984. A few months later, the device was being sold by Nid Valley Micro Products, although still manufactured and distributed by Cambridge. This device, costing $14.95, consisted of a small pass-through interface and a separate controller box in a rather fetching yellow design. Once connected and the game loaded, you could freeze the game by pressing the left-hand button, or pressing the right-hand button would allow you to change the speed of the game using the dial on top. In tests it worked well, allowing you to slow down a game so that you could practice those difficult jumps or tight spots, particularly when the screen is full of enemies. The freeze frame could help people making maps, or to allow them to halt the game while they plan their route through a particular difficult screen. And in fact Crash Magazine used the device to allow them to freeze the game to take photographs for the reviews. You have to remember, not everyone is a gaming god and devices like these could open up games that previously were simply too complex, fast or difficult for people to play. This device lasted quite some while, still being sold in mid-1986, and luckily it worked fine with my Div MMC, so games could be loaded quickly, but it had to be last in the chain. Next to arrive was the Pace Setter, also from Nid Valley, arriving in mid-1985. Nid Valley produced two versions of this full-sized interface. One was programmable, costing $24.95, and the other non-programmable, costing $14.95. Both incorporated a joystick interface, which is where the programmable part comes in, and both have the same slow motion control as the smaller previous interface, but no freeze frame. The nice yellow design is gone, replaced by a normal joystick-like interface with a rotary speed control and an on-off switch. These devices worked in the same way, allowing you to slow down or freeze a game, you did that by slowing the game down as much as possible, and also giving you the added bonus of a joystick port. This device would not work on any modern media storage, so it was back to the old TZX Duino to load my games. In practice the device worked well, and playing games at a slower speed felt odd at times. When these two interfaces were released, Nid Valley put out notes to various magazines, alerting users to always check for the slow-mo logo. They claimed that other manufacturers were trying to sell a similar product, and this would infringe their copyright, that they actually didn't have yet, although they were applying for it. Should they get that copyright and patent, then it would be curtains for the other suppliers. This, I presume, was in answer to DKtronics releasing their own version called the Games Player Interface, later renamed to the Games Controller, just before Paysetter put out their own two interfaces. The DKtronics version was almost identical in functionality to the Nid Valley Paysetter, employing a joystick port, on-off switch and rotary speed controller. It was also cheaper, costing 12 95 
but did not allow freezing the game, nor did it have an LED to indicate if the slow motion function was active or not, although to be honest it would be obvious. In a review, Crash Magazine said that they preferred this device over the original slow-mo unit, as that sometimes crashed games after freezing, whereas the DK-Tronic one was rock solid. This device would also not work on modern storage systems, but once the game was loaded via the TZX Duino, it worked fine. I tested it on several games, and it's interesting to see the border flicker on Aquaplane. Obviously the split border effect relied on timings, and slowing the game down broke all of that. It's nice to see a slow motion death in Night Law too. The history on these devices is pretty thin, with both companies ceasing to advertise them around the same time, mid-1986. The need for these devices, I suppose, would be limited, and although very useful for magazines to get good pictures of games in play, the average user would, I think, pass it off as a novelty. The best use, and the one that probably never got exploited, would be to allow complex and fast games to be more playable for people with less cognitive functions, or poor hand-to-eye coordination. I'm thinking here about young children or special needs adults that didn't want to be excluded from the wonderful world of computer gaming. What does worry me though, and maybe some of you technical people can tell me if this is true or not, is the potential to damage your CPU or other components. I definitely heard a high pitched whine when some games were slowed down, and that was worrying. Would a Specky be put under extra stress from having its CPU slowed down forcibly? Who knows? Anyway, that's the slow motion devices, at least all the ones I could find. An interesting idea that worked well, but had a limited audience. It is interesting though to think that the screenshots in Crash Magazine were made possible because of this device. released in the arcades by Sega in 1980. Being an early arcade game, it is a simple affair where it tries to replicate those old fairground games with air rifles that you had to shoot targets to win a cuddly toy or a goldfish that would die the next day. There were very few versions of this for the Spectrum. The only other one I can think of was Quackers by Rabbit Software. There are additional elements too, but let's look at the Spectrum version. Carnival was released to Sinclair users by Eclipse Software in 1984 and I do like the cover. It also boasts a chance to win a graph pad, however, this must have been a separate piece of paper because there's nothing in the inlay about it. The screen mimics the arcade layout, but is wider due to the Spectrum's resolution. At the top there are rotating pipes, under those are three rows of moving targets. You move left, right and fire, but you have a limited amount of bullets. These can be replenished though by shooting the boxes with numbers on them. Every now and again a duck will fly down and these have to be shot as soon as possible because if they reach the bottom they'll start eating your bullets. You can get extra points for shooting the letters that spell bonus, but you have to hit them in the right order. There is music playing while you play, but this can be turned off if you don't like it. Other than that though, sound is a bit sparse, with just a sound when you hit something or when the duck eats your bullets. The graphics aren't bad and quite close to the arcade game, so no complaints there really, and gameplay is the same too. Once you run out of bullets, the game ends, so it's all about accuracy, and as you can see, I'm rubbish at it. A nice little arcade clone then, but because it's just like the arcade game, it doesn't really do anything different, it doesn't break boundaries or have any outstanding features. It 
it's a good version of an average arcade game. Storm's wife, Corinne, has been taken prisoner by the evil Unakum. With his comrade, the wizard Agravain undead, he sets off to rescue her. This game is a top-down maze beat-em-up, very much in the style of Gauntlet. Your character runs around, collecting items such as food and keys, and shooting a variety of enemies, and destroying the enemy generators to stop them spawning. You know how it goes by now. The control mechanism used, however, is a bit tricky to get to grips with. Instead of the usual movement controls, you have rotate and move. This means the left and right controls rotate you left and right, and you have to press the forward key to move forward, which is a bit annoying really. The graphics are large, in fact too large really, and they do move in character squares, and this can be a problem when trying to line up shots or line up a doorway. You can exit the screen into other rooms, and the keys and switches can be used to open up other areas and walls. Because of the graphic style and colours, sometimes it's difficult to work out what's an enemy and what's food and what's a generator. The food items though are generally easier to spot. The sound is what I would call early Quicksilver sounds, which were fine for early Quicksilver games, but in this game it's just the same effect used over and over again. The gameplay is average really, at times boring, and at other times exciting when you enter a screen and it's full of enemies. However, when you clear these enemies and generators, and leave the screen and then come back in, they're all there again. For a flip screen maze game, and a budget release, it's not bad I suppose, but it's certainly not Gauntlet. There are so many new games coming out that it's impossible to cover them all by having only one per episode, so every now and again I'll do a quick roundup. And here's such a one, and these are games released in late 2019. First off is Drift from Retro Souls, a technically good game with a great intro, but very difficult to get to grips with if you'll pardon the pun. Next we have Space Monsters meets the Hardy from Mayhem. This is a great little platform race against time game where you have to find the key and get to the door in a time limit. It's got excellent music and brilliant graphics. Next we have The Hair Raising Adventures of Mr. Hair from Lee Stevenson. This is a nice looking platform game with an interesting new game character. This is Dirty Dozer by Miguatello. And this is a nice platform puzzle game. You have to get the block to the target by pushing it 
and bulldozing your way through the walls. And finally this, Valley of Rains, from Yoisa Entertainment. This is very reminiscent of Savage, and it's technically and graphically very impressive. A beautiful game to look at, and the gameplay is excellent as well. So today we're going to chat about games that we can't play. It depends on the reason. There are lots of reasons why you can't play a game. Either you don't like it, or it's too hard, or the control mechanisms don't work. Or So I suppose there'd have to be a reason as well. Well, I can think of one. I love the Ultimate games, as I'm sure is well documented on this channel of mine, but I cannot play Underworld. That is probably the control and the bouncing about, the, the actual game mechanics, because it is difficult, especially when you, you try and time a jump and miss it, and then you just bounce around, bounce around all over the place. And just start falling and falling and falling and falling. And then try and get on the bubbles to get back up and fall off them again. And get bounced off and lose another life. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> It, it, it sort of it, there isn't any other ultimate game that's got that same mechanism. Um, they've used obviously there were three D ones. There was things like Lunar Jetman and all that sort of thing. But that sort mm. of stands on its own as having this weird control mechanism. Yeah, I might put Nightshade into the same category. That's a bit difficult and fiddly. Right. Okay. But I, I could never get on with the three D games in general. I mean, I'm getting used to it now, but I just couldn't grasp the the idea of of jumping and judging the distance between blocks that were floating in midair because I, I, it was, I don't know, I just found it difficult. So I suppose that, that could come into my category of games I can't play. <laughs> but that's because I can't... I All can't, isometric yeah, games. it's because I can't get to, used to the controls. Not that the control mechanism is bad. It's just that for some reason I don't get on with that 3D view. I actually really like them and enjoy them. I, 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 would, I, I would like to get into them and get far enough into the game so that I could enjoy it and get used to it. But it wasn't until very recently after talking to you, I think, that I got... I learned how to do the double jump, you know, the where you drop the object and then climb on top of it and then jump and collect at the same time to get extra height. Yeah. So after all these years, I've only just figured out how to do that. That's definitely an ultimate mechanic. <laughs> it's in a few of the other ones. Yeah, yeah. What about Ant Attack? Did you ever try that? Because that's hard. Yeah, Ant Attack, I loved that. I played it all the way through after, I don't know, about three or four months after I had got it because there was a competition in your Spectrum magazine and I played that and played that all the way through, and I got I really picked up them controls quite easily, strangely enough. That is strange, because I never have. <laughs> right. And that's got really fiddly controls. How are you with Manic Miner? I can play it, but I'm not good at it, so that that would... I mean, I can get to about Eugene, um, Eugene's Lair, level 5, Yeah. and then I can't get any further than that. That's another one I absolutely love. We've, we've probably gone off topic, you'll probably have to cut this bit, but I... Um... <laughs> I'm really rubbish at all vertical shoot maps. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm a bit better at horizontal. Yeah. Scramble in the arcade, I really like yeah. things like Penetration on the Spectrum. I love, but anything vertical, Flying Shark, I couldn't get on with. I was okay at slap fight, mm. but not that good. Anything, any vertical shooter, I'm really, really rubbish at. Don't know why. Um, um, slap fight, I can't do because the bullets are the same as the background and you can't tell which is which and it gets really, really frustrating but I, I still keep going and trying all the different ones so it's a favourite sort of genre for me. Here's a game that I can't play and I think you can is Bounder. Oh, I love Bounder. I just can't get to grips with it at all. Are you trying emulators? Yes, I am, yeah. You need absolute precision control. It is much, much easier on original hardware. It's one of the few games where I notice the lag in the controls on an emulator. Right, okay, I might give it a try. Really, really do. And I think the reason is that as you bounce, before you start moving, you need to press in the direction you go, and you, you've almost got to time it so you get the absolute maximum distance on the bounce. So 
on original hardware, it works really, really well. But it, it seems to me that I, I can do about two or three bounces and then that's it, the game over, really. Yeah. I wasn't very good at the original Kong by Ocean because I couldn't get past the first screen and there is some dodgy collision detection on that. Um, that's, that is really hard. Yeah. I think it's having to be pixel perfect to get up the ladders. Yes, yeah. You can stand for, at the bottom of the ladders for ages and not being able to get up them. Yeah. And, and jumping over the barrels is virtually impossible on it as well. Yeah. Uh, Lunar Jetman, that I can't play at all. I can. Uh, it's, di it's difficult. I've managed to pick the bomb up once, put it on the back of the uh, rover, and then get get killed. So <laughs> I haven't even managed to do anything other than that. I think the fuel mechanic makes that really difficult, but I really like it. I can play. I've got. I think without any pokes or anything, I've got up to about level twenty-one. Right. Okay. Now this is odd because I'm. I love Cyclone. And I can play that, but I can't play TLL, uh, yeah, TLL, Tornado Low Level, which is the same mechanic, but faster. Yeah, I'm the same, for exactly the same reason. <laughs> it's really difficult judging the height to fly over the funny little circles that you've got to fly over a low. Yeah, so. yeah I, we're bad game players if the game's bad. Well, there were some good games in there, Paul. <laughs> okay, we were bad gamers some of the time when some of the games were bad. Okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> there you go. Hungry Horace, the maze Pac-Man-like game released by Scion and Sinclair in 1983. This was one of the games that was available on Sinclair's ROM cartridge, being 16K, and being that size, it was a very simple formula. As with the other Horace games, the intro screen is annoying. And I mean, why? Why do they do this? On to the game itself. And for those who have never seen this game, you control Horace, their little blue thing. And he has to negotiate his way through a pack, collecting flowers or eating flowers, which is a strange hobby to have. He's chased by the park keeper and he has to avoid him, which is tricky in some of the mazes, uh, I mean parks. There is a bell which is continually ringing, which is annoying, and if Horace gets to this it scares the park keeper off. If Horace stays in the same park for any length of time, another park keeper will appear. And that's about it. You clear one maze, go into the next one, and so on. Because of the layout and random movement of the park keeper, the game is not fair. When I say that, I mean there's no way to determine where the park keeper is going to move, and more often than not, you can get trapped very easily. Sound is adequate, I suppose, apart from the annoying intro. The game had two more official sequels, Horace Go Skiing and Horace and the Spiders, the last one being a 48k game. The Horace games are loved by many and hated by many, and let's just say I'm not a big fan. A simple, challenging maze variant with an annoying intro. I think that sums it up rather well. Sinclair wanted to lead the way with business and educational titles, trying desperately to steer people away from the games aspect of their micro. We'll look at the educational part in another episode, but here are three titles they produced to help this force direction along, opposite to what the users wanted. View 3D is a very bold attempt to produce a 3D drawing tool for the Spectrum. At the time of its release, in 1983, computer graphics were only just breaking into the movies with films like Tron and The Last Starfighter. CAD packages were available for much larger and expensive computers though, but these were well out of the reach of the manic minor masses. The instructions to this program are long and complex, describing how to build up objects using X, Y and Z planes. It allowed you to draw lines and slowly build up models in slices. The process was painfully slow, as you built up each layer, hoping it would look like the thing you had in your mind. Most of the time, it never did, and to be honest I never managed to get anything decent produced, so in the end I loaded the famous wine glass example. Anything you can create can be rotated in any direction, and 
much to the wonderment of the many, displayed with hidden line removal or actual shading. The speed at which this happened was slow, very slow. The end result though for an 8-bit micro could be impressive, even though most people just drew boxes or random shapes. The next title was View Calc, and this was Sinclair's attempt at a spreadsheet. You do get a basic layout with rows and columns, and you can add data as you normally would with text, numbers or formulas. To add text you enter the quote mark first, followed by the text, and you just add numbers as you would normally. To add a column of numbers up, you simply entered a formula such as A1 plus B1 plus C1 for example. Or you can use a shortcut if you have a lot of numbers to add up, for example ampersand C3 colon C7. As you can see it's fairly easy, but it's also easy to crash. And when it does, you lose everything, or at least that's what you think. For example, entering A1 plus V1 will give you a nonsense in basic error. The instructions cover this though, and how to get back into your spreadsheet, if you read them that is. Despite reading the instructions though, I failed to find a way to create a spreadsheet that looked like the one on the cover. Maybe I missed something, but I did read them quite a few times. Anyway, moving on to the final product, and this is ViewFile, a database program. Again we have a simple program, you just type in the field names first, you can move the cursor anywhere on screen, remembering that you need space to actually enter the data items. You then enter the start and colour of each data item, again moving the cursor around to where you want to start. And finally you can enter the data. It all seems straightforward at this point, Maybe because it is, and after all it is only a 16k program. Once finished you can move backwards and forwards through your data and order it by any field. And you can print it out if you have a printer. You can also search for a string in any of the fields, and if you've got a lot of records to go through this could be useful. The inform command gives you details of records and remaining memory. And yes it's all very basic, but it does its job in a basic kind of way. Sinclair made an effort. But as we all know, games were the driving force, despite the rumours that Sir Clive was far from happy with that fact.